Now, a lot of your fans, there's all yep. sorts of Jordan Peterson groups that you can join who debate whether you really believe in God or not. So let's just get it on the table. Do you believe in God? Hmm. <laughs> I, don't think that's any of, I don't think that's anybody's business. I think it's the most private question you can ask someone, but then I would say also, uh, what's the right response to that? By their fruits, you will know them. How's that? Well, let, me right let me ask you a different question, 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 question then. Do you, do you think there is a God? Uh, I'm terrified that there might be. Here's, <laughs> how's that? And I, you know, I'm not trying to be a smart ass when I'm making that comment either. Like they say, it's an, old, it's an Old Testament saying, I believe that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And that's actually, that is actually about as true a statement as you could manage in such a short phrase. And, you know, people have congratulated me. I was at the Buckley Institute last night. They were congratulating me on my courage. And I think, and I said this last night, it's like, you guys don't understand. It has nothing to do with courage. I'm just afraid of different things than the people who lie. And I'm afraid, for example, of what happens when you lose control of your tongue. And I said that back in 2016 when I first opposed the Canadian government. And people were, you know, congratulating me. It's like, well, you're so brave to stand up to the government. It's like, I'm nowhere near as afraid of the government as I am of what happens when people lose control of their tongue. I studied totalitarianism for, well, since I was 13 years old in depth. And I know what happens when people lose control of their tongue. Uh. What happens is everything goes to hell. And I don't mean, I mean that metaphysically. I mean, I might even mean it theologically, but you can just say, don't even bother with that. But what's fascinating? Let's just okay. mean it practically. But what's it you know what? I have to say, I've always thought Jordan Peterson had a Schleiermachian view of, 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 of God in, in, in the sense that he views God as almost this absolute fear that you have towards a certain object, which is completely abstract. It's not concrete at all. So whether God exists in itself is meaningless to him. But nevertheless, what he is talking about, what about that religious feeling is man's facing of the infinite, the feeling of the infinite. Because everyone has a feeling of the infinite, whether you like it or not, whether you're a materialistic atheist or you're the most religious theist, you have a feeling of the infinite in the world. You know that the world is infinite. Why? Because you know you're finite. If you're finite, the world must be infinite. And you have these constant questions of, of potentiality, of, of future in there. And that is by definition infinite, right? And, and in some sense, when you have that view in sight, what you realize is that you're finite, so you're afraid of your finitude. And that precise, that dynamic of you in face of that infinite is fundamentally the religious feeling that Jordan Peterson is presenting. And that's a very Schleiermachian view and, and not a Hegelian one. I mean, that, I, I, that's too much of my theology side speaking. But nevertheless, there is that important notion there of how does one intuit God and how does one wrestle with the question of God? And, and that's a very profound and fundamental question, which I'm not exactly sure how we wrestle with, but it, it's definitely something to have. And I think Jordan Peterson is very wise in saying, I don't know whether God exists or not. He's not claiming that God exists, but nevertheless, he recognizes that dependence and that fear on whatever you call, let's say that proposition X that must exist, which leads to great fear in his life. That is what he views as God. And you know what? Fair play to him, right? As a metaphysician, you might say, well, that's just problematic. But as an existentialist, as a phenomenologist, you do see reason to that prop proposition and that presentation of affairs. The first thing I would say is, well, what do you mean by believe? Like, do you think that a statement about the existence of God is something like a scientific theory? Do you think it's a list of facts? Is it a factual question? Does God exist or not? Is it a factual question like you're asking about whether a cup on a table exists or a plate on a table, an artifact in a room? What do you mean by this? What do you mean by believe? I'll stake my life on the proposition that God exists. How's that? I mean, the, the philosopher um, Price actually argued that believe in and believe that are two different things. For example, you could say, I believe that this pen exists, but it doesn't mean I believe in the pen. Believe in implies some sense of attitude, a sense of worship towards this pen, which is a very important thing. And I apologize the lighting is just completely horrible, but I mean, the light's just coming in that way. I mean, I can't do much about it, but nevertheless, I believe in this pen is different from saying, I believe that this pen exists. For example, you could say that the father believes in the child and also believes that the child exists, but it's very difficult to say, well, actually the child, the father might believe that the child exists, but he might not believe in the child to actually be his child or that the, the child is going to do a good job, right? So there are distinctions between the idea of belief and belief that, which are actually have been written about in literature. Hey, sounds good to me. And so you might say, well, I said I pray always. So what does that mean? I'm trying to say the most, the clearest words I can say. And I do that by paying attention. I'm listening to the words and feeling them as I move along, thinking, is that a firm foundation in the morass? Is that a, is that a bridge over the abyss? Is that word the right word? I do that when I'm writing. I do that when I'm talking. And I do that because I don't want to be in the abyss. And the pathway over the abyss is the truth. The idea of prayer, that's a very interesting presentation. In, in some sense, it's almost close to the Catholic presentation of prayer because Catholics, they have, they often pray from prayer books and then they, they, they pray whatever the, the saints pray before them. For example, for meals, they'll say, bless us, Lord, in these thy gifts that we receive through thy bounty, through Christ thy Lord, amen. So when you're going through that prayer, when you're going through that structure of prayer, you're meditating upon the significance of those phrases. So instead of saying, like the Protestants pray by saying, actually, I'm going to say something out of my heart, you're saying on a premeditated or pre-presentated or pre-written 
idea or notion of prayer that you're going to be saying. And then you meditate upon those ideas. And that's what Jordan Peterson seems to be saying about how he's praying. He's thinking about the significance of certain words or certain propositions that he believes to be true to the most fundamental degree. And that is what he considers as prayer. There are things that are far worse than dying. So if you're only terrified of dying, you've hardly begun to plumb the depths of existential catastrophe. <laughs> death, death is fairly, you just don't have an imagination. What could be worse than dying? Being a prison guard at Auschwitz? But you'd still be alive, even if you're witnessing horror. It's not death that the Oh, ultimate... no, I'm thinking perpetrating it. Right. You mean... Carry... How, about, how, about being an Auschwitz guard, how about being an Auschwitz guard who really enjoyed his job? Hmm. How about that? That's worse than death, as far as I'm concerned. Right. I mean that. No, no, I, I see that. That's I'll... hell, man. Yeah, it's a living hell. That's hell. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. But do you, think, there so, is, but do you so, think there's an actual hell, Jordan? Is there, is there somewhere that people like that go to, which is hell? Oh, definitely. Now, what, what relationship that has to what happens to you when you die, I have no idea. I mean, I don't think anybody's in a position to speak about what's truly beyond our ken, let's say. I don't think we understand consciousness at all. We don't understand time. We don't understand the relationship between finitude and, in, and, and, and the infinite landscape that surrounds us. That's all a great mystery. And I tend to leave that alone because I try not to speak about things that I can't speak about. But does hell exist? It's like, study history and see if you can figure it out for yourself. I mean, does, does heaven there's exist? Nothing, there's nothing that's more obvious than that hell exists. So does, I mean, does heaven exist? Mao's China was hell. Right, but does, so you're talking about hell on earth, but do you believe there's a hell after death? Like I said, I, I, I can't, I can't, I don't speculate about such things. I don't, that's where my ignorance finds its, what would you say? That's where my knowledge finds its limit. Hmm. I'm, I'm concerned enough about what I'm doing right now, right here, and, and leaving the rest of that. And, you know, I'm, so I have to leave it at that. The hell that I see as a potential on earth is sufficient as a deterrent and it's of, of sufficient reality. You know, you can ask, well, is it eternal? Well, I would say, well, look, all totalitarian states are variants on a theme, let's say, and that theme persists. All archetypal stories are eternal. Everything that happened in the Bible happened and is happening and will continue to happen forever. It's part of the eternal human story. It's hyper real. And, and heaven and hell are part of that. Mm -hmm. What that means in the final analysis, I don't know. I mean, you asked, I think you asked in there, you know, hell is real, is heaven real? It's like, well, heaven is as far away from hell as you can get. Mm -hmm. That's a good way of thinking about right. it. Um, I've spent my whole life trying to determine how you get as far away from being a camp guard at Auschwitz who enjoys his job as possible. Blimey, I mean, there's actually quite a lot to unpack here philosophically speaking. I wasn't expecting that this would come to discussion on God, but it has. And um, I would say there's two things here, right? Firstly, about heaven being whatever is as far from hell as possible. That's a very interesting claim because in traditional Christian theodicy or theology, they view he hell or evil as a privation of good. So what is bad, what is evil in this world is purely a result because good doesn't exist in it. But what Jordan Peterson is trying to say is, well, good is whatever is not evil. That is a very interesting twist. I'm not sure where that goes, but perhaps it is almost somewhat true, but then that would then suggest the spirit of evil is fundamentally more real than the spirit of good. And I'm not sure whether that is the correct claim. And if it's not the correct claim, is he then arguing that the spirit of evil is the same as the spirit of good? Well, that, that fault seems to fall into the Manichaean heresy, but I'm not exactly sure about the metaphysics of it, but it definitely is a very fascinating view that you could think about. Like what actually is a fundamental layer of reality? Is it good or is it evil? That's a very interesting question. And number two, what is hell? I view that hell is a part of a conscience, and I'm not saying this in a metaphysical sense. I'm saying purely that our conscience is strong enough to make our living existence heaven or make our living existence hell or act as a sufficient punishment for heaven or hell. For example, let's say, and Christians always get asked this, right? What if Adolf Hitler was to come to God at his death? Would he go to heaven? Well, number one, what does it mean to come to God at his death and then would he go to heaven? But number two, apart from that, well, I would argue, I'll hypothesize that the infinite guilt that one feels upon a true realization of God who is supreme and wonderful and beautiful, in that realization, the pain and knowledge of your own wrongdoings will be sufficient to justify whatever you consider as hell. I think that is a very good presentation of how strong the conscious is. And I would say that presentation of the conscience is precisely what makes something hell or heaven on earth, but also potentially what we call purgatory in this life. You know, people don't understand. People think of God as the joke is a cosmic butler. You pray to have your wishes granted. It's like, he's not a genie. You want to you pray? It's like, pray about your stupidity. Here's a prayer that'll work for sure. You want to see if prayer works? Here's one. This will work. Sit on the edge of your bed. Ask yourself, what bloody stupid thing do I continue to do that's making my life more miserable than it has to be and everyone else's life around me that I could give up, that I would give up? And, but you have to really want the answer. So you open yourself up in humility to a revelation. You'll get an answer. It won't be when you want. That's how you'll know it's true. But if you act on it, then your life will improve. And that's a proper prayer. Yeah. That's I have to say that is truer than you could ever imagine. Like, I heard that phrase in a YouTube short like quite a while ago. And I have to say that's something which I've been trying to do recently. And it has been something which I would say has 
has worked to some some sense of things. I mean, you open yourself to flaws within yourself and your conscience and your subconscious, which you perhaps would not have realized otherwise. And that is something I'll highly recommend you to do.